everyone, and welcome to The Darkest Hour. I'm your host, Amanda Jane. Have you ever met a ghost, a spirit, a demon? Was it everything you thought it would be? I always wanted to meet a ghost, face to face, if you will. I wanted an experience like Casper, my very own friendly ghost. But even in Casper, you had to consider the others, right? The not-so-friendly ones. Because where do they go? It would appear they too are just beyond this other side. And it would seem that you don't get to choose your experience. At least, that's what I've learned from others. Tonight, we've got a collection of stories recounting experiences with perceived good and perceived evil. So, let's get started, shall we? This happened to me a few years ago. I couldn't tell you why I suddenly had the urge to write it down, but here it goes. A few years ago, I was living in an older house in a small university town in northern Idaho. I'd been living in that house with three other roommates for a few years at that point. My roommates had come and gone. My mental health was an ebb and flow, just like any other person. At this point, my sister was living with me and had experienced her own paranormal things that I was indirectly connected to. But for the purpose of this post, I want to just focus on one particular experience that I had with a little girl. This particular night, I had done my nightly routine, washed my face, brushed my teeth, scrolled through Instagram, the works. It was just like any other night. Eventually, I tucked my phone out of reach and I fell asleep. I woke up in the middle of the night, not completely unusual. I usually wake up once or twice during the night. It's pretty rare for me to sleep through the whole night. Usually, I just turn over and go back to sleep, like usual. But this night wasn't usual by any stretch of the imagination. There's one window in my bedroom which faces the neighbor's porch light. They very rarely turn it off, so there's always a certain amount of light coming through my window into my room. But when I woke up, everything was dark. I didn't immediately think anything of it. I mean, at some point, the porch light would have to burn out and be replaced. Honestly, it didn't even cross my mind. Something was up, though. My anxiety, something I medicated for, immediately spiked. My heart began to race, and any ounce of tiredness I had in my eyes was gone. As I stared, wide-eyed, at a little girl, across from me, crouched by my bookshelf, only about two feet tall, maybe less, was a gray little girl. She looked emaciated. Her hair was almost sticky-looking and matted. She was wearing a nightdress, think Little House on the Prairie, and it was shredded at the bottom and dirty. She was crouched, almost like a frog, and it was like she was soaking up whatever light was coming from the window, making the room completely dark, except for a gray light emanating from her. If that was all it had been, I think I would have just rolled over and gone back to sleep. I had done something similar to a shadow figure over my bed previously. But it was her face. Her face told me that she wasn't some innocuous child, spirit, ghost, whatever. She was something awful and something I needed to fear. Her eyes were very large and she had no eyebrows. Her matted bangs covered most of her forehead, so I could focus on her white irises and goat-like pupils. If that wasn't enough, she was smiling at me. But it wasn't a sweet smile. It was a menacing, 
evil grin. It stretched from ear to ear and bored into my soul. Once I realized what was going on, that there was an evil-looking child in my room, I went into fight or flight. All I could get myself to do was hide underneath the covers. I didn't scream, jump out of bed, and run. Nothing. I was so scared, I couldn't move. Eventually, I knocked myself out of whatever terrified trance I was in. I had regulated my breathing, and my heart rate went back down to normal. I peeked out from under the covers, and I saw that there was nothing there. I was so relieved and figured that somehow a bad dream had kind of leaked into real life for a moment. I got up from my bed, wary but confident that it was an absolutely terrifying dream. I decided, if it was a dream, I would go downstairs to grab a glass of water. When I have bad dreams and I don't move around, I can get sucked back into that dream, and from my reaction to this one, I absolutely wanted to not get sucked back in. So, I got my glass of water, climbed back up the stairs, and walked down the hall to my bedroom. I put the half-full glass of water on my windowsill. I didn't have anything else to put it on around my bed. The entire house was silent, and I managed to fall asleep again. I don't know how much later, but I woke up again. The room was again so, so dark. I immediately knew something was wrong, again. I searched for the little girl across the room by my bookshelf, and she wasn't there. I was relieved, but I knew that something was off. Slowly I realized that there was light coming from the side of my bed, and it was that gray light. I turned my gaze downward to the edge of my bed, and there were those eyes, the white goat eyes, and the sticky, matted hair. Then there was that smile. I could feel the weight of that glass of water on my bladder at that moment, the menacing evil smile stretching ear to ear. I couldn't see the rest of her body. She was so close to me. All I could see was her eyes, looking up at me, and the enjoyment that she was receiving from scaring the ever-living shit out of me. This time, I screamed. I yelled my sister's name and threw the covers back over my head and cried. This wasn't right. I had done everything right. I went and got a glass of water. I shouldn't still be in this awful dream. I don't know how long I stayed under the covers. I must have eventually fallen asleep because the next morning I woke up to the morning sunlight streaming through my windows and birds chirping outside. It took a minute to remember what had occurred the night before. I immediately went to tell my sister what happened and that I was very annoyed she didn't come to my rescue. After I told my sister, I came back into my room and I noticed that the glass of water had fallen onto the carpeted floor. So I did get a glass of water. I wasn't just dreaming. I must have knocked it over when I reacted fearfully to the second approach from the girl. Anyways, that's what happened. I'm wondering if anyone else has had an experience with something similar, a ghost girl. My cousin suggested it was a demon in the form of a girl, feeding off of my fear. I'm not sure about that, but I am sure of one thing. I never want to see her again. I was 27 and working at a Boy Scout camp far up in the woods of very northerly Northern California. Where I worked had a large population of black bears, which for the most part were rather harmless and easy enough to scare away with a shot from a rifle. However, we had a large number of Boy Scouts at this camp weekly, 
sometimes as many as 500 heads. And with a lot of vastly spread out campsites, there's going to be a few campers who sleep with candy bars in their pockets and basically make themselves a pre-packaged dinner snack for a bear. I'll tell you this, black bears love Reese's peanut butter cups. As part of staff, oftentimes, I was scheduled for bear watch and basically strolled the entirety of the camp with a rifle, going from site to site, making my presence known so as to ensure the bears wouldn't come anywhere near. On one of these routine nights, everything was more still and more quiet than usual, and I remember finding it rather odd and unsettling. I had just checked in on the camp, the furthest away from all the other campsites. It was a good half mile away from base proper. As I'm strolling along the trails that run beside the lake, I stop to take a number one, and I light a joint. I had it stashed away for such an occasion for being out by the lake at two in the morning. As human beings, we have natural gut feelings we must always adhere to for survival. There was definitely a gut feeling I had that things were amiss. Not only was it unusually still and quiet, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched and that I was most certainly not alone. I nervously took a few puffs from my J and then I put it out, now being more aware of the unnerving sense in the air. I've been face to face with a bear. I've been stalked by a mountain lion. I've slept a little too close to a den of coyotes late in the night. But this was different. I didn't have the sense that I was in the presence of any of these animals. The smell was overwhelming. It didn't smell like any bear I've experienced. It was almost sour, but still musky. I'll never forget the smell, but I can never find the words to properly describe it. As I reach for my flashlight, before considering to ready my rifle, a massive boom hit the ground, falling from the trees above, and nearly knocking me on my ass from the sheer force of it. I reach for my flashlight that had fallen to the ground as I heard something large, something massive, running away from me into the tree line, up into the hill above. Immediately, I consider it was probably the biggest bear I'd ever come across, and black bears can be spooked easily, so at first I considered myself lucky. But as I lay there, hyperventilating, shaking and quaking in my boots, I started to consider the sound of the beast running away, it didn't sound like the strides of a black bear in flight. It sounded bipedal. It sounded human. I braced myself, stood up, readied my rifle, released the safety and shot upward into the air toward the lake. It woke many campers and the scoutmasters alike. I stood out there for a good ten minutes alone before camp leaders and some other staff came to me. During that time, I had my flashlight out and was inspecting the scene. Whatever had dropped from the branches above fell from possibly 20 feet, and in its wake of running away had torn off branches, taking off into the hill line that stood 13 feet from the ground. And some smaller trees were bent almost all the way down into the ground. I've never seen a bear do that, that's for sure. By the time some of the staff and some concerned campers arrived, everybody was stumped. Most campers, to comfort themselves, insisted it was just a bear. I do know this. No bear running on all fours stands 13 feet tall. And no bear can run on two feet for 12 yards, uphill, on two legs. They just don't do that. We're all thinking it, so I'll just say it. I think I encountered a Sasquatch that night. If not, I don't know what it was. But I'm glad it was running away from me and not at me. Because whatever that thing was, beast or man, it was gargantuan. 
and I would not have stood a chance if it had decided to confront me. I grew up in a farmhouse that was built in the early 1800s. I lived there with my brother and my parents until I was 10. I was young, so some of my experiences seem very foggy. So I'm going to share the experiences my family encountered. A little backstory on the house. Multiple people had been killed there. A lady was shot behind our garage, and someone fell down our steps and snapped their neck. That's basically all I know about the house. It was located in the middle of nowhere, with the woods behind it, with a very old house and a garage that was visible. Our farmhouse was two stories, with a dirt basement that had walls that were still made out of lead. One time, my brother woke up late at night. His room was on the second story, facing our backyard. Outside his window was the roof of our porch, and for some reason, he opened his curtains to spot a lady waving her arms back and forth, over and over, on the roof of the porch. He was young, so you can pretty much expect his reaction. My sister, who didn't live with us, but often slept over, fell asleep on our couch in the living room one night. She woke up late into the night. Our living room was connected to our dining room and saw by our computer, which was right next to the couch, the apparition of a little girl who was staring at her. She didn't give me many details, but said that she ran up the stairs to my room and hid on top of my bunk bed. My mom had more encounters than anybody. My mom is a very spiritual individual. She feels very connected to the spiritual realm. When we began moving out of the farmhouse, she believed the spirits became angry with her and our family. She woke up one morning where she would switch her position to face the doorway to her room, and she'd seen a dark figure staring straight at her. She claimed this felt as if it was going on for minutes, until out of nowhere, the figure leaped in one swift motion straight to her and suddenly disappeared. The thing about my childhood home is that I never felt alone. I don't know if this was a good thing or a bad thing. This is my first glitch. It may not be as exciting or creepy as some of the others I've heard, but I thought it was worth sharing. Yesterday, I was on the bus, listening to music with my headphones, just looking around. I see this woman sitting three rows ahead, facing me, and I remember thinking that she looked like this one actress in my country, but then realized it wasn't her, just similar features and hairstyle. She was wearing a green dress with some flowers. After this, I just continued looking through the window and outside, and after two or three stops, I see the exact same woman outside at the bus stop. She gets on the bus and sits in the exact same spot. She's wearing the same dress, and once again, I notice that she looks like that actress. And I'm like, didn't I just see her on the bus a couple of minutes ago? So yeah, it was kind of weird. But after reading so many posts like this, I guess this is a normal thing to happen. But I was excited to finally have something happen to me. So this happened about four years ago. My dad works nights, so I'm home alone until about 2.30 a.m. most days. We live in a pretty quiet area where people usually keep to themselves. One night, at about one in the morning, there was a knock at the door. And when I checked through the peephole, there was a young woman with a car parked near the curb in front of my house. 
I answered, and she looked really young. Maybe 15, 16. Or she just looked really youthful. In short, she looked just barely old enough to be driving. She told me that she was having car trouble and asked if I could come and check it out, possibly give her car a jump. At this time, I didn't drive, I didn't have a car of my own, and I didn't know very much about cars. So I was of little help, but offered to call someone if she needed AAA or a tow service. She declined, but kept insisting that I check out the lights on her dashboard to see if it was normal. At this point, I just didn't want to be outside with a stranger, so I politely informed her I'd be of little help because I had zero knowledge of cars. I went back inside, but I kept looking through the peephole. She opened the back door, got into the back seat of the car, and then the car drove off. It instantly made my stomach drop, and it had me extremely freaked out. I was kind of distraught thinking about what the real reason was to approach my house. Who was driving? Just the entire thing left me confused and frightened. I spent the next few days a little on edge because I was afraid that they may return knowing that someone is there or that I was alone. I also think of that girl and who she was. I wish I had a video doorbell at the time so I could find out if she was a victim of some sort. I don't know. It still bothers me a lot and is eerie as hell. This story is about my old haunted house. So basically my house was haunted by an old woman who lived there before and she died around August in the house. Every morning, my mom would wake up and see that the calendar was flipped to August, and every day, she would flip it back. Her coffee would be made for her, and it would still be hot. And when we moved, all of the woman's clothes were behind our dresser. Mind you, we already cleaned the house completely, including the dresser, but it was all folded and smelled like fresh clothes out of the dryer. So, that was weird. But anyways, I was playing with my cousin, and he threw my stepdad's hat at me from the other side of the bed, and it hit my face. Then I screamed in terror when I saw a white glowing hand cover my face. I threw the hat down and passed out after. I woke up, and my cousin asked what had happened. So I told him what I saw, and he said he had a dream the night before of the same hand trying to kill him in his sleep. He said he didn't want to freak me out by telling me this because I have to live in the house. Well, here we go. This is the story about when I started believing in the paranormal. When I was younger, I lived in a town called Culpmont, Pennsylvania. It was one of those half houses where we owned one side and another person owned the other. I always got strange vibes. The stairs to the basement and the upstairs felt like it was on fire. I would become red every time I went up and down them. My breathing would become heavy and at one point it got so bad I passed out. My parents thought I had asthma, but the doctors said I was healthy as a horse. One night, I was in my bedroom. I had Spongebob on and fell asleep. I woke up in the morning, and sitting on my rocking chair was an older fella. Wet strands of hair, a stained tank top, dark, cold brown eyes, a chain wrapped around his legs, and boxers all while he was soaking wet. He disappeared, but then I heard a dark noise from my closet and a light emulating from it. I opened it. It was my Furby. So I took the batteries out. 
but it wouldn't stop. It kept talking. Then I looked behind me, and there he was, the man, grinning with his crooked teeth. He charged me. I dropped to the ground, and I got hit with a sudden cold feeling. I opened my eyes, and I was soaked. I screamed. Boom. My door slammed open as my parents rushed in. I exclaimed, The devil, the devil. My mom cuddled me in her arms, and my dad was asking what happened and why I was wet. Once I calmed down, I explained everything that happened. I changed into dry clothes and was put back to bed. It was explained by my recently divorced dad that he's seen this guy before, but nothing else. That's all he said. Now, me and my mom are living together. The demon was taunting me, and fast forward to 2021. Me and my dad had a big fight after he got water dumped all over him. And then he ran at me and beat the shit out of me, which we went to court for. I'm safe now, but I'm still shocked by these events. In fifth grade, I made friends or was starting to make friends with two girls who were new to our class. These girls were stepsisters. We'll call them Erica and Erin. I had learned that they moved here in the middle of the previous year, but they were being homeschooled at that time. After summer vacation, Erica told me that her mom decided to put them in public school since she wouldn't be able to homeschool anymore. I remember thinking that it was the coolest thing ever, that her mom was a teacher, and I thought, I wish my mom could be my teacher. Anyways, since I moved around a lot, I knew what it was like to be the new kid, and so we all got along right away. They seemed great, normal enough for fifth graders. And so a few weeks after our initial meeting, I went to their house. It was the first and only time that's all it took to realize that things weren't quite right. Their house was on the very edge of town, further away from most of the houses that I'd been to, and further away than my own house. I asked my mom to ride the girls' bus home. It was a different route than my own, but she agreed, as long as I sent her the address and phone number, so she could pick me up before dinner. Getting off the bus and walking to the house... I realized that there weren't many neighbors around, and there were no cars in the driveway. It was a large-scale house, from what I remember, Victorian-esque. Outside and from afar, it looked sort of amazing. Up close, you could see that it appeared to be in the middle of a remodel, making it look as though it was falling apart, more or less. Inside, still large-scale, more than one floor, big staircase, big windows, pillars, etc. But I also remember it being pretty dark inside. Not evil, just not a lot of light being let in, if that makes sense. My friend's room had their window shades open, but I was curious why the house seemed so dingy. When I went to turn on a light, the switch, it just didn't do anything. I noticed that there were no adults home. I wasn't sure what to make of this. On one hand, I was excited. Big house, new friend, good times. But on the other hand, I worried constantly that I wasn't supposed to be there or something. Even with the feeling of wrongdoing, we got on just fine. We played board games in their room, built a fort in their big living room, and we hung out on the tire swing. It was attached to a huge tree on the side of their house. Everything was kind of perfect, actually. It wasn't until we started playing Hungry Hungry Hippos and actually got hungry ourselves that things didn't really seem right. I'd asked my friends if they had any snacks. They both looked at each other, and then they looked at me. 
They sort of looked around the house or the room. Not really, just these. They pulled some snacks from their backpack. Snacks from school. As they were opening them, I decided to ask where their parents were. And they did that same thing they'd done when I asked about food. Looking at one another and then me, but not really answering me. I changed the subject, asking if we could go back out to the tire swing. The two of them were pushing me for a while as I laid on my back on the tire swing. Eventually, they laid on the grass on either side of the tire swing. So I'm looking up towards the second story window that's in the middle landing of the staircase. And I'm just swinging back and forth. Then, in that window, I see a woman. She's got long red hair, wearing something light colored, maybe a dress or robe. I try to sit up and stop the tire swing from moving, but it's no use. I just look up at the woman, and she's smiling, waving. I return a gentle wave. Is that your mom? I say this and I move my gaze to Erica. Both Aaron and Erica sit up. Second story window, Aaron asks me. Yeah, where did she go? I said. She's dead. Erica says this slightly under her breath. You saw my mom's ghost. Everyone sees my mom's ghost except me, I guess. Now, being in fifth grade, I didn't handle this incredibly well. At first, I thought they were messing with me. And so I essentially made these girls tell me about the death of their mom or stepmom. I made them search their own house with me to make sure she wasn't really there. In retrospect, it may have even been traumatizing to them, but they were gracious enough to entertain me. After all was said and done, I could find no girl in the house, no woman, no person besides the three of us. As almost dinner time approached, I knew my mom would be arriving soon, and I couldn't wait. I thought about the rumble in my stomach, and I decided I needed to ask my mom if the girls could come to our house for dinner, even if that meant telling her there were no parents here. When she showed up, it felt like she was a bit early. She saw us sitting outside on the tire swing. I told them to wait there and that I was going to ask her if they could come to dinner. Almost immediately, she got to the question of the parents. Apparently, she tried to call the phone number I'd given her, and it was no longer connected. So I told her, Their parents aren't home, Mom. I don't know why, but they aren't here, and there's no food in the house. I think that was enough for my mom, since she immediately agreed and told me to grab the girls and some of their things so they could stay the night. I remember the girls staying with me for a few days, we went to and from school together, but I don't remember us having any deep discussions about the situation as kids. I do remember asking Erin if she really had seen Erica's mom's ghost, and she said that she did. And she also said that her dad did too, before he left or disappeared. Eventually, Erin's mom came to take Erin and Erica back to Utah. We stayed pen pals for a couple of years, but we lost touch in middle school. Fast forward to high school, senior year, my friends and I decide that we're going to visit the old house, see if it's still there or not. We drive out there and realize there's more houses in the area now, but this house is still standing, slightly remodeled, but still standing. It doesn't look occupied. No lights on, no cars in the driveway, but we just drove past to circle around. When we do, we see that the long-standing tire swing is moving back and forth. Not like wind moving it slightly, but really moving like it's being pushed. 
but we see no one in sight. As I slow the car down, I ask my friends if we should go out and explore. Just before they can answer, I hear someone humming. I ask my friends if they're humming, and they say no, all while the humming continues. I ask if they hear it too. They shake their heads slowly, and one of my friends says, maybe we should just get out of here. I agreed, and I start to drive away. I hear from the back seat, no way. I look in the rear view, and I can see that she's facing, looking out the back window, and I see something glowing, but that's it. Tell me that you see that couple. It has to be the same woman, your friend's mom, the long hair, the white dress. She's like glowing bright, I swear to God. I thought about turning around, but instead of stopping the car, again, I just kept driving. And I said something like, yeah, honestly, you're probably right. Part of me thought that my friend could be messing with me. But at the end of the day, I had seen the same ghost years ago. And at times, I hadn't been believed. So who was I to be a naysayer? Years later, and I'm talking 2010 when I'm well into my 30s, my mom tells me what really happened with Erica and Aaron what she learned during that time, and also from Aaron's mom. Their parents bought the house together shortly after getting married, with plans to remodel the whole thing, part home and part schoolhouse. Both of the girls agreed they wanted to do schooling in Colorado with Erica's mom and Aaron's dad. Erica's mom was diagnosed with an aggressive form of cancer, which took her life over the course of just a few months, right before I met the girls. Apparently, the parents enrolled the girls in public school before she had passed. But once she passed away, Aaron's dad had what could only be classified as a mental breakdown. He retreated to the woods not far from their home and shot himself. Authorities wouldn't find him until my mom and a few others had called child services and the local police. She said the first night the girls stayed with us, Erica had confided that she wasn't sure of the last time that she'd seen Aaron's dad, that it had to have been a while since all of the food was gone and the light stopped working. My mom believes the girls were left to fend for themselves for weeks. I told her about the ghost that I'd seen when I was younger, of Erica's mom, and my mom said that she got chills. She said that she had to go back to the house with the officers one day, to grab clothes for the girls while waiting for Aaron's mom. She said when she was in their room, she felt a really warm presence with her, like someone had hugged her shoulders. She said that she definitely didn't feel alone in the house. It's sort of a dark story, I know, but it also has some light in it, I think. The girls were reunited with their existing or surviving family, and if I think back to what my friend had said in the car that night, tell me that you see that couple. Maybe it's possible that they're together again, one way or another. Well, everyone, it appears we've reached the end of tonight's episode, our 30th episode of the season, nonetheless. So thank you for joining me, for sharing your stories, and continuing to support the channel. If you like The Darkest Hour and you never want it to end, be sure to hit that subscribe button, tap the notification bell, and tell all your friends. Do you have stories like these? I'd love to share them. Send them to me, Amanda, darkest hour at gmail.com. Be sure to check out our subreddit and follow me on Instagram, the darkest hour, YT. And I'll catch you right here, same time next week. Stay spooky. <laughs> <laughs>